You're watching Tag TV. Hello, everyone. The next topic is about uh, innovation and uh, thinking outside the bun. It's not tackable. Uh, thinking outside the box. Okay. So uh, our panelist is Mukesh Chatterjee, and he is a uh, it's a serial entrepreneur. Okay. Uh, uh, means uh, like started several, several companies, and he is currently heading Neonet uh, LLC. And he has uh, his master's from uh, RPI, and uh, he uh, has over 20 patents in uh, various different technologies. I'll hand it over to uh, Chetarji to introduce the rest of the panel and take it over. Uh, thank you so much. Um, every time I get introduced as Mukesh Chatterjee, I wonder the expectation for my wisdom goes higher. So, but, so I'm not from Bengal, I'm from Rajasthan, so low, low. <laughs> so, with uh, kidding aside, uh, I'm honored and privileged to be here. And it's a wonderful panel we have for you. But in addition, I, first of all, I do want to thank the organizers organizing committee, uh, conveners, Dr. Bansal, Dr. Abhay Astana, who couldn't be here, and Sanjay Ji. Um, and it's a marvelous job they have done. And I also want to thank all the volunteers. They are the backbone of what's, how this came together. Countless work, countless hours. <laughs> hours, days, weeks, and months. And that's what it takes to put it together and they all are like bricks in the wall, which no one sees, but they truly are what makes us as community. So heads off to them, and I want to thank that. Um, it's unfortunate Dr. Astana couldn't be here. I mean, he, has, he leads the VHP North America and the wonderful job he has done. We all owe him a great sense of gratitude. I, I do have, and I think all of us do, a great sense of gratitude. In fact, my kids went to Bal Vihar. Preeti and I sent our kids to Bal Vihar, and they still are friends with all the kids. They went there, and they've been him and Jayaji have been doing this wonderful job. I wish he was here, but uh, we, I'm sure we'll see him back, hearty and healthy, and doing well. So um, with that, I want to introduce uh, our panelists. And um, so the, I guess the bio will go in certain order. Yes. Gee, so you can read the bio, so I'm not going to repeat it. I'll just say what I think of G. First thing that comes to mind when you see him, that within a minute you will be smiling. I'm serious. He has a great sense of humor, one of the best sense of humor I have seen. And in addition to that, he has a remarkable ability to get to the essence of things. Any one of you has seen his emails. I have never seen an email, and I've had many of them, more than one line in it. Very economical with words. He's the first environmentalist in my mind. <laughs> and I'm also convinced that if he's so minimalist when it comes to usage, if he was an artist, he would be a perfect minimalist. You will make a world-class one, sir. But uh, he was also the first entrepreneur in New England area of Indian origin whose company actually went public. When we were the engineers, the doctors, the account, I mean, the, we never were the CEO material, no matter what. He started his company, quit his job, started his company, did wonderful things, and he was an inspiration to all of us. And a lot of us who got into entrepreneurship, we owe actually to him. And personally, I'm actually indebted to him for the inspiration you provided. So thank you. Uh, next in line is... Uh, Dr. Ravi Kanjolia. So he's a scientist, a tremendous scientist, in fact, and um, is truly humble at the same time. And the thing, and he's a friend. And again, maybe it's my preference. I always like people who are smiling. So he, I've never seen him upset in my life, although his wife may disagree with that, but I'm not sure. Um, he's, in addition to his bio, what he has not written there, he actually was part of the team that President Obama had assembled of certain 12 CTOs, I believe, 
to guide the country and come up with a plan for next 10, 20 years. So he's very highly thought of everywhere and we're delighted that he's part of the team. One of the other things which I don't think very many people know, that he actually spent some time in his early years in Rishikesh with Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. It's interesting. Um, next is Deepak. And again, Deepak is a dear friend. He's a world-class security expert, also a serial entrepreneur, onto his third company. And it's just his knowledge base in this space is tremendous. He sits on the boards of various companies in security space and is always ready to help other entrepreneurs. Last is Ram. So Ram is a dear friend. I like to think that he's the same age as mine, with some minor differences of maybe 20 years. He's, a, he's an incredibly successful entrepreneur. He has done, this, he's on to his third company now. First two were in semiconductors. The third one, believe it or not, is in dental insurance. And I'm positive when Preeti and I, my wife and I asked him, if he even knew who the dental insurance company was in his previous two companies, and he didn't know. <laughs> so talk about a non-linear thinker. I'm serious, I mean, he decided that enough of what's going on with dental insurance world and the way companies behave, he's going to fix it. And he learned everything about it, and now in three years he knows more about it than most other people do. So any one of you who has any companies and they need dental coverage, I'm serious, I'm, I'm not telling just to advertise. He's a tremendous entrepreneur, a lot of respect. He's a man of high integrity. Very rarely, I mean, you see people with such an honesty and integrity that uh, uh, is uh, unbelievable. So uh, with that intro, I think I took more than two minutes, which I was given, but then we started early, I think. Um, so I, I'm supposed to provide some comments, so I promised everybody I'll keep it in less than five minutes. So, you know, when I was thinking about it, it's, uh, it's organized by World Hindu Council. But if somebody asked us, and I was thinking, what is a Hindu? There are about 400 attendees in this conference. I'll bet any money there will be 400 answers. Some will be variation on the theme, and some will be in a broad range from violet to red across the spectrum. So if somebody asked me what will be, so I thought, okay, what will be my answer? And so I came up with these ideas, what are the core beliefs that we all share? What are the three or four threads that bind us together as Hindus? That's common among all of us. In my mind, the very first one, which is the soul is ageless, timeless, and immortal. That's our core belief. No matter what part, what subsection, what different community, whatever, wherever you come from, or the region, but that belief is fundamental to our belief. The second is that death is certain if you're born, and if you're dead, rebirth is certain, and that cycle will continue until one gets to liberation. And Bhagavad Gita very, in a, incredibly good way describes how you get to liberation when you become a sthit pragya, and that's the last stage. But until then, we continue in the cycle of death and birth, no matter what. The third one is the karmic theory. We all believe in, which is we are solely and entirely responsible for our actions. I should correct myself, I am solely and entirely responsible for my action, otherwise all my actions I would have given to my wife actually for all the bad deeds, but so ours is a bad choice of words here. Uh, but truly it is, we are responsible. And that responsibility, good or the bad, continues and transcends the life and death because it's connected to the soul, not to the body. And as a result, the events, the incoming events that come to us in any life at this given moment or this opportunity, that is dependent on the past good or the bad deeds. How I deal with these past good or the bad, my accumulated ledger, using my vivek, which is the key word, 
is determines how my next set of bindings are going to be or am I going to be on the path to liberation. So the value of the Vivek, the whole Bhagavad Gita, the symbolism is around Vivek. Those three things I really believe is what, what ties all of us together. I don't believe there can be a Hindu who says, I don't believe in soul, Atma, Ajar, Amar, Avinashi. If you don't, then there's a different problem. I mean, there's something, something. So I think these three are like the uh, bumper sticker on a car, if you are a Hindu, if you will. That's what ties all of us. So I'm glad that uh, we are here. And I believe that as a Hindu, anything I do in a subtle way or in a big way, these three core principles affect me in the actions I take, in the decisions I make. In some cases, it is more influence. Some cases, it's less influence. Sometimes, you know, in some of us, some of the more enlightened ones, their Vivek is like a million watt bulb in their head. And for some, it may be a millionth of a watt. And we migrate between the two depending on how we are doing. But it guides us in all what we do. So with these three threads that bind us together, independent of our additional denominational, whether it's a Shavik or Vaishna or uh, North or South or caste or the community or uh, regions we come from or what part of the world and uh, everything else, these three ties us with that. I have a wonderful panel here. They have graciously agreed to come and share their uh, life stories in five to seven minutes each. So that's a plenty of time, I guess, <laughs> to share the whole life story. And how these threads, or the, they all played a role in each one of their lives, but going beyond, they're highly accomplished, successful, and how did they think outside the box to do certain things that make that made them so successful. And frankly, they, all four of them, they make us very proud of their accomplishments. And it's not only their individual accomplishments, but their collective accomplishments of all of us, because they are part of our community. And it's a collective testimonial to what we have accomplished as community. So I'll invite uh, Jeet to share his life story. He promised me, since he's the oldest among all of us, he will take the longest time. <laughs> Good afternoon. So continuing on the uh, theme that uh, Mukesh Chatterjee was, uh, <laughs> was talking about, uh, I'll tell you a story. Uh, so uh, in my first company, it was taking a little bit longer for the company to go public. So one of my investor, lead investors, says to me, he said, Jeth, I just realized that you are a Hindu. And as a Hindu, you are going to be reborn. So you can make your money in your next life. <laughs> but I have to make my money in this life. So could you hurry up? So <laughs> So uh, it, is, it is very interesting uh, perspective. Uh, so to, it, this afternoon, I'm going to share some of the things that uh, I've learned over a long entrepreneurial journey. And to a certain extent, that journey is still continuing because I love entrepreneurs of all kinds. In fact, I cannot say no to anybody. And, and the reason I, I find it so interesting is because I'm still learning a lot. Every time I meet a young entrepreneur, he or she is full of energy, very, very positive, and that energizes me. And even at this age, I stay very entertained by the whole thing and continue to devote a significant portion of my time to the general area of entrepreneurship. So let me take, I mean, uh, share some observations with you. First of all, let me warn you that 
anything that I say here has nothing to do with what you might learn in the business school nearby or any other business school. These are primarily my own observations through the practical up and downs of my entrepreneurial journey. The first thing I would say is entrepreneurship is a solution to all of our problems. And, and the journey of entrepreneurship is really a win-win situation. And by that I mean when an enterprise is successful, or even if it is not success defined in the Western sense, we will not go into the definition of success in a Hindu sense, but let's define success for a moment uh, from a Western point of view. Even when a company is successful or not successful, it's a win-win situation, and let me elaborate. When a company becomes successful, it generates a significant amount of energy. That energy is self-sustaining. The entrepreneurship is a virtual cycle. I cannot recall, because there are so many, companies that folks who worked in my companies went on to start something on their own. And some of them built even more significant enterprises. And I, I'm sure they thought, if this guy can do it, I can do it too. And, and, and that you know, type of a transmission keeps the ecosystem going. And I'm actually more proud of those successes than what my companies did. The second thing is, when a company or when an entrepreneurial journey goes to a successful outcome, it enhances the lives of so many people who feel the positive energy, the positive learning, the teamwork, and so on. And that is, that is amazing. Now remember, I would not talk about the terms of success that media and common people talk about, which is things like market cap or wealth generation, or things of that type, they are all important. But in my mind, at this stage in my life, the more important things are the generation of energy, the generation of the ecosystem, the lives that it helps, the employment that it creates, and enhances the values in all other ways. So that's, that's why the entrepreneurship is a win-win situation. So folks talk about, so Jay, what happens if the journey does not have a successful outcome. And my answer to that question is that if you are intellectually honest, even a journey that doesn't result in the so-called external success, even in that case, you would learn a lot about yourself than doing anything else. Because then you would know what you are capable of doing, how you can learn from uh, your mistakes, and how you can move on and do better, better things. So to me, it's a win-win situation. In fact, I love, uh, if I, in any way I can help, and entrepreneurs who tried and did not succeed. Because I think that person has learned a lot more than somebody 
who gets lucky like me and, uh, and, and you know, moves on to other things. So just remember that the entrepreneurship journey is a win-win situation that creates so much energy, that enhances so many lives, that solves so many problems, and so on. Having said that, entrepreneurship, I'm sure you will check me on my time. You got plenty of time. Okay. <laughs> the second thing I would say is the entrepreneurship is not up for everyone. And by that I mean the real reason for going on this journey, as far as I'm concerned, is because you want to prove something to yourself. It's not for the outside world. It's not for wealth creation, though some of those things are side, side benefits. But it is because you saw an issue. You saw a business model. You saw a technology. You saw an opportunity. And you want to convince yourself that you can do something about it. So it is all self-generated. You don't need to read any books. You don't need to listen to people like me. If you feel that you have the inner desire to go out and do something and to prove something to yourself, not to anybody else, then to me, those are the best entrepreneurs. Because our schools and our books and our media tells you you do all those things. You study the market, you do this, you do that. But before you do any of that, I suggest that you seriously look inwards. Because if you do that, it's a win-win. You cannot lose. Because you don't want to get to my age and say, I should have, would have, could have, all that. Those words have no meaning. Go out and do it and learn from it. And it's beautiful. The last thing I would say, and that is for this audience, many of my friends say that being somebody who's an NRI or somebody who comes from some other country has a disadvantage in starting out on, an, on this journey. They cannot be more wrong, especially people in this audience, people with this background, people with these sanskars. You have a tremendous advantage. Right off the gate, you are better than 99% of the people. And the reason I say that is the following. Most of us, thanks to our parents, have had great education. Most of us come from a very secure and loving family background, and that's very important. Most of us have a religious or a cultural background that is open to open thinking, where we are not so rigid. The Hindu religion is not so rigid that it is not open to new ideas. We, I mean, just think about us. Many, many languages, many, many food habits, many, many different uh, things that we have to deal with, even in our own country, without leaving India. So we have a tremendous advantage. Don't let anybody tell you that you have a disadvantage. And then on top of that, we are in a country that rewards entrepreneurship and does not look down on failures. So anybody here or your kids or your grandkids, please never accept that you, have, you are at a dis disadvantage. And I'll tell you this, entrepreneurship is a great, great journey and it's a lot of fun. So thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Ji. That's wonderful. Now I invite uh, Dr. Conjolia to come and share his thoughts.
Good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's really nice to be here. Thank you, Mukesh, for inviting me to this session. I have never attended an event like this before, and I'm blown away with the commitment and passion that I'm seeing here. An example of nonlinear thinking is Mukesh himself. So this session is on technology and entrepreneurship. And you must be wondering what a scientist is doing here. I am too. Well, he wanted to balance out all this superstardom by an ordinary person. So that's how he invited me here. So in general, my journey as a Hindu American to America is no different than the rest of you. We all studied in India came here for more studies, research, got jobs, and became successful. I would like to talk about particularly a defining moment in my life that sort of uh, is an event that connects me to this particular event. So after my master's, again, I, I did this in 70s, so the choices were you either go work for an industry, you'd go do MBA, you go do PhD, things like that. So you're totally confused. What do I do next? Do I take the first opportunity that comes along? So I did something totally different, and I started to think about why I did this, but it just so happened, there were some coincidental things as well. I actually took an year off. And I said, I'm going to go explore. And those were the days where people were, people were very interested in Beatles songs as well. And I heard that Beatles have learned transcendental meditation. So I actually went to Mount Abu in Rajasthan for three years, uh, three months, and took a teacher's training course there for transcendental meditation. Took that course. This was my first foray into uh, the meditation and yoga. I went there as a skeptical person, but once I started to take it, I really got immersed into it. So we were a group of about 30 people, all lived together, and started to learn meditation. It used to be five hours of meditation and yoga every day, and rest of the time uh, listening to the teachings of Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. So came back, and now I started to think about what I'm going to do next. And then it became very clear to me that all I have to do is just go do PhD. It became very clear to me that that is what I want to do. It doesn't end here. So I got invited to go to Rishikesh for an advanced teacher's training course. So now this is really an intense course. So I went there. For six weeks we did that and got further selected to come to Delhi to spend some time with Maharshi Mahesh Yogi. So we were there, and that's where you are listening to Maharshi, and what an experience it was. So now, now I'm in dilemma again. Do I continue with the meditation? Or do I do the PhD? Well, I chose the PhD path, Otherwise, I probably would have been a colleague of Dr. Rothenberg. I would have been here. So anyway, what does that teach me in doing science? It actually gave me tremendous focus. It gave me conviction and courage of my ideas that I could follow it. And it gave me a lot of positivity. And you know, we talk about glass half full, glass full. In my case, the optimism is at the level where glass is always overflowing. So I'm always looking at the positive side of things. 
So when I hear and when I'm doing uh, signs, no problem for me is like it can't be done. It's always how we will be doing it. Okay. So how it connects back to the science, that, that kind of optimism, that kind of focus, how it comes back to the science. Uh, I am a material scientist. I invent and my team invents materials that you experience day to day in your devices, cell phones of the types. And you know where, I don't have to tell any one of you where this thing is taking you. What you see today will feel very primitive uh, 10 years out. Okay. So what will be the role of materials going forward is what I study. Okay. Looking at in a non-linear way, right now it's all silicon based, but we are thinking should it remain silicon based? The kind of devices we look at, are these devices, even though they are very powerful, all, are these devices going to be used in the future? Would the amount of data that we would be generating, and when I say we, it's humans plus machines, when we will be generating these data, you don't have enough amount of silicon in the world to make chips. So one of the ideas that I have heard, and people are working in that area, is it will need about like one billion kilograms of silicon to make the chips of the future, and you can have a glass full of DNA to do all this work. So here comes the challenge. Yes, DNA is great. The memory continues. You can store a lot of information. How do you interface with DNA? So that's where a lot of nonlinear thinking would come into place. Okay? With that, I will take my seat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ravi, for this uh, wonderful talk and a very thoughtful and uh, something to ponder over over time that our creator, if there was such a thing as creator, unless you believe in your own soul as a creator, actually the DNA has far more capacity in our cells in our body, have far more capability in our brain than all the things combined together to, to date. So it places us in the scheme of things. We are really, really small. And, as a, as a human being. Um, I invite now uh, uh, Deepak Paneja to come and share his thoughts with us. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Mukesh, for inviting me. Um, what a great conference. I've uh, been chatting with, uh, with several people and uh, listening to the discussion here. Um, it's, it's fascinating. Um, it's, a great, it's a great group of people here, and uh, Mukesh's comments about the threads that bind us, I think, are, are very appropriate. So what I'd like to do is just spend a few minutes talking about my background, my entrepreneurial journey. and. Um, in particular, focusing on some key attributes that I think really help entrepreneurs move forward. Um, and I'll tie that to, to this topic of nonlinear non thinking. So like, like many of us on the panel, I grew up in, in India. I went to school there, did my bachelor's, and moved uh, to go to graduate school, moved to this country. I was raised in a small town. Um, in Bengal, near Calcutta. Uh, my father was an engineer, my mother was an elementary school teacher, and I spent more time playing and reading novels growing up than I did studying. So I was not, uh, not really into, into academics a whole, a whole lot. Um, I went, uh, when I was doing my bachelor's degree, um, 
I focused on getting involved in lots of different activities. I was playing bridge and badminton and tennis and writing for my college newspaper, getting involved in producing shows, comedy shows for our campus TV, TV network. And when it came to academics, I focused on things that I enjoyed, courses that I enjoyed, topics that I enjoyed. Um, I sort of neglected the rest. So I took some of the hardest and weirdest classes that you might think of. Uh, and my friends would tease me. They said, why do you want to take that class? It's the hardest professor, terrible grader. You'll get a C. And I, I didn't care because I was interested in the topic. Um, and when I, when I came, um, I did the same thing for my master's, actually, in grad school in this country. So my first job uh, working in the US was for, for a large company called Intel that uh, you folks recognize. And um, I learned a lot about business there, the fundamentals of, of business. And, um, um, and since then, um, I worked for a couple other companies after that, a couple of startups. And it wasn't until my 30s that I really ventured into entrepreneurship. I was, I was risk averse. Uh, there's this um, lot of discussion about how entrepreneurs are risk takers. I don't, I don't agree, not always. I think uh, entrepreneurs, uh, there's a lot of other things about entrepreneurship. They're not always, it's not just about taking, about taking risks. So my, my journeys have been fun and f fulfilling grueling at times, uh, but I want to talk about a few key attributes that, that I think helped me. The first is curiosity. So I was really curious about everything. As I said, I spent a lot of time uh, doing all kinds of things in college and in school. Um, and that, I think, helped me. So when you think about this concept of nonlinear thinking, it's really about bringing patterns from other disciplines, patterns of thought, ideas, and sort of combining um, all these different ideas, combining um, angles and perspectives from various areas to bear on a single problem, on a single solution. And that, that I think, is, is, is something that um, can really help an entrepreneur move, move forward. Uh, the, second, the second attribute, I think, is um, and again, it's something that I learned through my journey, is authenticity. I think that um, being authentic is all about acknowledging your own strengths and weaknesses, uh, about being transparent with your customers, with your employees, um, building an authentic brand, building an authentic product. Um, quick story from, from my last startup. Um, I started the company in 2005. We had a product around the middle of 2006. And the first time we walked into a large enterprise to sell it, it was a security product. The uh, chief security officer listened to our pitch and then came up with, um, sent us a long list of requirements for what, what he was looking for. Um, and what, what we did in response, uh, it wasn't really an RFP as you think about RFPs, it was more informal than that, but um, what we did in response to that was to be very, very honest, very, very truthful, very, very authentic about what we could do, what we had thought about, and what we couldn't. And, um, and we were surprised when we were invited by, by the company to demonstrate exactly the things that we had, we had said we could do. And we were then, um, we won a million dollar deal from this company, which was a coup for um, you know, a startup that, uh, that had just built its first, its first product. So it was, I think, the, this notion of being authentic. We were very transparent with with the customer about what we could do, very transparent about our goals and objectives, and that was impressive enough to win, um, to win a big deal for us. Finally, I want to talk about persistence. And, uh, and a word that's actually used quite often these days, which is grit, right? 
Um, and the idea really is that, uh, you know, it's, it's glamorous to think about creating nonlinear thinking and coming up with a great idea, but entrepreneurship, as we know, is not just about an idea. It's, it's about building a business behind that idea, which takes a lot of work, a lot of persistence, a lot of focus. Um, it takes sustained drive. And I think of that as, um, as grit. Um, so it, you, you somehow have to work your way through thick and thin and, and find a way through all of the obstacles that come in your way. Um, so another, another story from, uh, from, one of, from one of the startups that I was involved in, we had this uh, really, we were competing with half a dozen other startups in trying to win um, the security business that was just starting out when the internet was taking off. This was the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, and the salespeople, our salespeople would come back to us and say, you know, there's all these other startups, they're all doing the same thing. Unless you folks can solve this one serious requirement that all our customers are bringing up, we're not going to be able to find a way to beat our competition. Um, and so this was, I won't get into the technicalities, but it was the whole idea was providing single sign-on for a cross-domain environment. And of course, the engineering team said, there's no way we can do this. It's impossible, right? And um, um, my response and the response of my, my, my senior team was, we are going to find a way to solve this problem, right? We are going to find a way through nonlinear thinking, through thinking of all kinds, through incremental thinking, through linear thinking. We're going to be persistent and we'll, we'll, we'll figure out a way to deal with this. And we did. So um, someone, a, a, a bright engineer came up with um, a nugget of an idea and then the rest of us built on top of that and over the course of a few months, we did what had seemed to be unthinkable before that. Now, this is just a story about um, a few months of work, but um, as I sort of reflect on, on my journey, and I'm sure many of you in the audience will, will identify with this, you know, it's a mix of perseverance and resilience that is often the backbone of, of, um, of a lot of uh, entrepreneurial journeys. Um, and in my case, as, as it is in most, there were many ups and downs and twists and turns, professional, personal, um, and you sort of just move, move through that. Uh, as our scriptures say, without any regrets for the past and any expectation of the future, you just move forward. Um, so are these entrepreneurial uh, abilities, curiosity, authenticity, uh, grit, um, are they innate or are they cultivated? Um, I think there is, it's, uh, it's a mix of nature and nurture, right? And I know we're going to have a discussion about this on the panel. But much of it, I think, can be learned. Um, I don't think it's innate. I think it is, it can be cultivated and it can't be learned. And I look forward to our panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Deepak. Always authentic. If uh, yeah. Thank yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, now I want to invite uh, Ram to the podium, please. Thank you, Mukesh. Good afternoon. I'll be nonlinear. Uh, you have heard enough about entrepreneurism. I connect everything to Hinduism. Uh, when I first started my company, there are two things, right? Any company. There is a human engineering and there is a financial engineering. Financial engineering is something you can get it from business schools. You can hire a CFO, P&L, how to price the product, where to sell the product, and salaries and all that, right? That you can learn. But the human engineering that's really required to be successful 
is not written in any business books. You can do a PhD at Harvard and another PhD at Stanford Business School? Absolutely no. That comes from the religion. Every human is different. Every, because a lot of times you don't go beyond your employee. There's a beyond your employee, there's a family too. So when you are working together in India, uh, marriage is not between two people, it's between two families, that's what they say. So as a startup, it's beyond employees, it's families, and it's, it's beyond that. But anyway, um, I, I came to this country, I worked at Bell Labs, a big company. I always wanted to do something different. Um, and uh, in India, by birth, we are all entrepreneurs. I can tell you that for sure, because if the train going from Delhi to Madras stops at Nagapur early in the morning at 5 o'clock, and there's a guy selling only the neem stick, and there's a guy selling only chai, 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 right? So these are all entrepreneurs. So there is always uh, opportunities flying by. And how do you grab them and uh, make those happen? So the fear of failure is another thing. And uh, by, by, by Hindu or Dharma philosophy, Vedas, the fa fear was not there. Maybe the British introduced fear for Indians. <laughs> so, and Jit said a good thing that being a uh, Hindu-American, don't think that you cannot be successful. That was the right thing. So I'll relate back, right? So when uh, uh, Vishwamitra goes to Maharshi, Brahmarshi, Rishi Vishwamitra goes to uh, Brahmarshi, um, Vashisht. He said, I want to be like this. Right? I want to be like this. And he came back and he made himself happen like that. So that's one thing that we can make it happen. We can be successful. Second thing I learned was uh, mentorship. This is again from Hinduism. Even Lord Rama had to go to Asista to get trained. And everybody had mentors, right? Arjuna had a mentor. And the mentorship, no matter how great you are, being humble and simple and uh, having one or multiple mentors at any time was a good thing. And that's what uh, we learned from Hinduism. Mentorship is very, very important. Last thing is the fear I talked about, so fear of failure. So that you can learn too, right? So when Arjuna saw all these guys, right, Bhishma, Dronachar, wow, I'm, I'm going to fail. I'm going to be dead. I can't do this. Look what happened, right? So in Bhagavad Gita, they said, cherish the, you, you can never control the result, period. You can never control the result. If you think you can control the result, even today I can give you an example of a great company from $50 billion to zero in one day. We work. Right? So you cannot control the uh, result. That's what Krishna said. I am the one who controls the results. So cherish the process and try to do what you want to do. Do your best. That's what I believed in. And that's how... I did it, and then when I saw problems, okay, I'm going to do it, right? I might have the big guys, uh, it's always like that, right? When Microsoft was started, the IBM was looking like this, right? How do I crush this guy? So when Facebook was started, again, Google was looking at this guy, and Microsoft was looking how to crush these guys. It's always like that, right? So again, if you connect this back to uh, Hindu dharma for everything, so as an entrepreneur, you are always lonely. So you don't have all the answers. So uh, you can go back to your room and look at, are these answers in uh, um, Vedic literature or maybe our Hindu mythology? I think Hindu mythology gives almost every uh, answer for every problem, right? Um, one other example I tell you, which I did um, follow, uh, mentorship is one thing, but Second thing, and Mukesh is one of my mentors. Um, so second thing is uh, alliances. 
partnerships. So don't you, do you think uh, Sri Ram would not have beaten Ravan with single arrow? He could have, but he had to make alliances with Sugriv. So look at those alliances they made, right? And then the other thing is humbleness, right? You have to go and make alliance. Don't expect them to come to you, right? We have to go, no matter how successful, how great you are, that's another Hindu um, philosophy or Hindu um, mythology or Hindu uh, Vedic literature taught us, right? Uh, Arjuna goes to every kingdom and Dharmaraj goes to every kingdom to make alliances for the war. They didn't expect them to come to them. That's what uh, Rama did, right? He went to Sugriva's kingdom to make an alliance. So be, making alliances and partnerships with the other uh, organizations also helps entrepreneurs. So why I'm saying this is for every, uh, be, being an entrepreneur, you are a lonely person, for, for every question, you can find an answer. So the business and religion, or business and spirituality, don't have to be mutually exclusive. They can coexist, and it will be more successful. Uh, if you go back to some of these religious leaders, how they build these organizations, then they're still sustaining. People follow them. So how do you make all your organizations follow one mission? So we can get there, we can get to the final point, get the product out, and everybody's working together, working hard. So a lot of these things, you, you can connect them together. Uh, so that's how I feel more nonlinear thinking and going back and saying, oh, okay, this is a problem. I think this can be solved. Let me see if that's in my Mahabha Mahabharat book, <laughs> right? Um, how, how to handle this. And it can be done. It can be done. When Arjuna saw all these people, right? Now I see all these people. Oh, okay. This guy uh, is IBM. This guy is Facebook. This guy is Google. He's got multi-billion dollars. They might crush me. I cannot do this. No. I think we can do it. So that's how we can learn from our own heritage and then apply. And because the opportunities are um, here and uh, we can make it happen. Uh, thanks a lot. And thanks, Nikesh. Thank you so much, Ram. Really appreciate it. So I got a few questions, and then we will take Q and A from the audiences. Um, let me ask four because I'm the moderator, so I'll have higher priority than you, Rajiv. You ordinarily you will. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, he's a dear friend. Um, I would take the question. So, so well, first question I have is for Jeet. Did you always plan to be an entrepreneur? Hell no. Uh, <laughs> No, it's, uh, I think the, the basic premise of my journey was uh, the basic, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. The basic journey of my premise was uh, just seeing something, seeing some opportunity, and then thinking, I think I can do this better. And uh, see, the issue of failure and risk was never a problem. I never looked at that as a risk. I think in all of our cases, our backstop is our education. So I knew that the worst that happens is uh, I go back and get a job. So uh, I saw an opportunity, I went on it. I, was, I never thought of myself as an entrepreneur, but uh, the opportunity came up and I said, maybe I, I can give it a try. Thank you. Thank you. So you weren't of the type who knew when they were born within five years they were going to be entrepreneur. You know, you see them on TV wearing bow tie, carrying a briefcase. Hell no, no. I was busy having fun. <laughs> okay. Um, I want to ask uh, you, Ravi, actually. So, you um, worked as a scientist. You worked at a large company. You actually worked at a, a, you taught at a university. And then you worked actually at the ground floor at a startup and then got, went up again. So you've seen it all. 
what did you find as a scientist that was common where you worked with people who were really good and they were okay? What were the outstanding scientists you ever come across? What attributes did you see in them? So yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, while I'm not an entrepreneur, I live the life of an entrepreneur to some extent. There is a difference though. You guys put a lot at risk. I had someone backing me up to start the uh, companies. But in general, in, in a good scientist, what I generally look for is uh, a, somebody who is curious, okay, creative, and collaborative. That topic came in earlier, and collaboration is a very powerful tool in my mind. We can't always do everything. There are a lot of smart people out there, and we should collaborate with them. Okay. So that, that is one principle we carried on. We are still doing that, even though we have a large R&D team, we still try to collaborate with universities, with centers of excellence, so that we can learn from them and bring it in. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the next question I have is for Deepak. What was one or two key challenges you faced, Deepak, along the way as you graduated from school? I'm not talking about your tennis career. I mean, you, I knew you were a great tennis player. But beyond then that in your journey. Um, so there were lots of challenges. Um, I think um, as I look back at sort of the journey in general, at uh, the entrepreneurial journey, um, and this notion of collaboration came up, right? It is a team effort. And a lot of the challenges actually are people challenges. So it's, it's um, you know, it, uh, we were talking about executing on an idea. It requires a lot of people, everyone working together, getting the right people on the bus and making sure the right people stay on the bus is actually a very difficult thing to do. Um, and so I, I think um, that's that's a key that that was a key that was a key challenge. Um, I think other uh, other challenges, as I look back, um, I was trained as an engineer, and when when you when you start your own company, you get into areas that you have no training for. So. Um, you know, you, you have to understand what a balance sheet is all about. You have to understand what's going on with cash flow. You have to understand marketing. And as you go up the ladder, even in engineering, you start getting exposed to some of these things, some of these areas. But um, to, you, you need a, a, a certain level of mastery around those, around those areas that goes beyond what, what you would simply learn about as a engineering manager or director of engineering or a VP of engineering. So that was a challenge. Uh, it's, it's a challenge that I think a lot of us face and uh, we just train ourselves uh, to get around those challenges. Got it, thanks. And uh, Ram, question for you. Um, as you know, um, a lot of our successes is really, uh, our family plays a large role in our success because we have that stability, that um, uh, help, that commitment which is joint, what role did that play in your own success? As I said before, as it's a lot of hard work, startup, right? So you have to have full support of your family because you're working long hours, you're working on Saturdays, you're traveling. So um, my wife, Santa, she took care of children um, all the time. So that gave me all the time to work and work hard and make Saturdays uh, working and long hours traveling. So the family plays a huge role, and um, absolutely. And then you come home and you're, you have a nice dinner made, um, and then you're um, having nice rest, and then go back in the morning. Without good family support, it would be very difficult to make that happen. Totally agree, coming where my wife and I are partners in business since day one. Um, I can vouch for that. 
Um, thanks. So I have um, additional questions from audiences. Jeet, this is the one which is a trick question. So just wanted to let you know. It says, was Enron and Madoff a success as entrepreneurship in your mind, considering you say all entrepreneurship is successful? I don't know who they are. <laughs> Never heard of them. What was the question again? <laughs> Skip it. Okay. <laughs> Look, it's the intent that matters ultimately, right? So their intent was bad. So if the intent is better than entrepreneurship, that's a bad entrepreneurship, frankly. But as long as the intent is good, and even if you fail or succeed, or things turn out differently, that's OK. I know Ram mentioned about WeWork. They went from 50 billion to zero. But the founder landed up making $1.7 billion, nice sum of change. So I'm not sure that's good or bad. Personally, I think it's good, but. <laughs> um, so the. Next one is, I think it's from you, Rajivji. What's a similar and different between nonlinear thinking and Jugar? So I could answer that. I think they're identical. All nonlinear thinking, a Jugar is the Hindi word. All it means is I see a problem. And how do I solve that problem in a way that's within my means or within the means of the people I'm going to sell it to? And every time I go to, I'm from Rajasthan, every time I go there, I see these uh, uh, little things that are moving on. They, in fact, are called Jugaad. They just got a, a pump and a, uh, an engine and hardly any brake, I wonder. But anyway, they figured that out and transport a lot of people. So I think they're, they're identical, in fact. That's inherent in us, in fact. It's just that it has been sleeping for a while due to our slavery and uh, domination by a lot of forces outside of uh, the dominant thought, and that's what made us believe that we couldn't solve our own problems, that we couldn't think for ourselves, that everything somebody else did was somehow superior to us, better to us, without realizing that we're all human beings with all our souls, and there's no way we could be superior to anybody, but we are not inferior to anybody either. They're two sides of the same coin. And I think that process is waking up, and that's changing. Sorry, I'm taking um, a lot of your time. I've been given warning about uh, the time, um, uh, I just keep, got to pick. There are a couple of questions. Uh, I think that, um, is that? So access to good education appears to be, have been one of the reasons uh, you're successful here in the US. A number of Americans of all colors are not as fortunate. They can sometimes lack nurturing network or communities. How can the Hindu American community contribute to the development of the broader community society here in US? Who wants to take that of you four? So I'll, I'll take this. This is a little bit closer to my heart. I often think about it that what we need to do in the local community and give back. And one of the ideas that I have is we are all, uh, many of us are experts in our field. And we should really connect with the high schools, not quite the high schools of Lexingtons and Andovers, but the high schools of communities where they don't have access to good teachers. And sh teach them technology with the passion that we have and connect it with the real day-to-day -day thing. I'm in semiconductors. I would go to a class, pull out my cell phone, and start to teach them chemistry. A physicist can do the same thing with the same device. So that's how we could kind of generate passion in the next generation, because we truly believe education is key to success. Let's educate the next generation, is how I feel. Thank you so much. Uh, how much time do we have? Two minutes. OK. I think this is going to be a longer one. It says, other religion entrepreneurs contribute to building their own communities, but Hindu entrepreneurs contribute millions in their name, that too mostly in US, but little to the very country that gave them education and discipline to succeed. What is about Hindu entrepreneur not work anywhere close to others? I'll take that. I don't think that's true at all. I'll, I actually vehemently disagree with it. I'll tell you one thing. 
what the saying goes, what one hand gives, other hand shouldn't know. Just because we don't put our name on the buildings and the facilities and other things does not mean that it's not done. And I'm not going to talk about myself here today, but suffice to say that you can assume that we all take care of a lot of things. Jeet has been highly, highly charitable to a lot of causes, and all these gentlemen sitting here, they do the best of their ability. So somehow assuming that everybody else is generous and we are not, is just not true. So I'll, I'll take the last minute uh, to uh, summarize it uh, with a story. Uh, in Ramayan, it is said, Virvar Lakshman, his knowledge in spite of being, having grown with Bhagwan Ram and in spite of being trained by Mary Shivashist, was fully knowledgeable except one case. His knowledge was not complete. That word was fear. In his dictionary, the fear did not exist. He was fearless. It didn't matter to him whether he lived, died, won, lost. It was irrelevant to him. So that's why it's considered that his knowledge was incomplete because he never understood what fear was. Similarly, an entrepreneur or a scientist who is not doing nonlinear thinking, it cannot be done, does not exist in their dictionary. I'm positive none of these four gentlemen actually ever think it cannot be done as an answer because they got that plenty of time in their companies and lives and otherwise, and they said, okay, let me figure out how to do it, with individually or together as a team. Similarly, a no doesn't exist in the entrepreneurial dictionary. dictionary. All no means is maybe or yes. And if no had any hesitation, it all missed me though it's emphatically yes. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, we never take no for an answer from a customer or from an investor anyway. And we just, we just keep trying and be persistent. So those are some of the attributes and the things, for example, what Deepak talked about, authenticity and in, inner integrity among us. I think those are the key attributes. But listen, thank you so much for listening to uh, this wonderful panel. And we are very grateful for sharing your stories. Thank you, Thank you again for taking time.